in May of 1940, while the entire British expeditionary force was being driven out of Dunkirk by the German army, Florey prepared eight white mice for an experiment. He injected all eight mice with streptococci, a lethal germ. One group of four was returned to its cage, and a second group of four was inoculated with penicillin. And that was the experiment that basically the world was waiting for Fleming to have done in 1928. By the next day, the first group of mice were dead, while the mice that had received the penicillin played in their cage. I think they were very, very excited and um, somewhat astounded, because I don't think they knew how effective this uh, material was going to be or, or was. And I think it was very, very shortly afterwards that they thought of trying this on patients. Culturing enough mold necessitated growing it in everything, from dishes to hospital bedpans. It proved to be an arduous process. The first patient that they tried it on was somebody who was virtually at death's door. A London policeman who had developed a systemic infection from a thorn scratch. He was working at his rose garden, and he had scratched his cheek. Now think of that today scratching your face with a thorn and dying of, or being near death because of the, um, the infection. I mean, it's, it's, it's unheard of. And they gave him penicillin, and he virtually rose from the dead. Day by day, he got better and better, and as he got better, they were running out of penicillin. Florian Chain had only a limited amount of penicillin. And unfortunately, it wasn't enough to save the policeman's life. It was now clear that a full course of therapy required 3,000 times the dose needed for a mouse. For their next round of experiments, Flory chose six patients, five of them pediatric cases, thinking that children would not require as much medication. And this was a miracle drug because all these people were, were destined to, um, to succumb. There was no way that uh, the, the doctors at that time could save those people. They picked the worst cases of the people who really needed it. Penicillin killed the infection in all six cases, convincing Howard Florey of its value. As he watched bombs rain down on the city of London, he knew that he could not afford to waste any more time. He must look outside England for financial support. In the winter of 1941, Florey made the decision to appeal to the United States and the Rockefeller Foundation, from whom he had once won a fellowship. Florey chose a colleague named Norman Heatley to accompany him to America leaving Ernst Chain behind to oversee their production efforts in June of 1941, Florey and Heatley boarded a Pan Am Clipper. They flew out of England in an airplane that had all its windows blacked out. Well, it was because of the, the, the German Air Force. They couldn't tell anybody where they were going. They flew to Portugal, to Lisbon, and Lisbon was a hotbed of um, of spies and from both sides because it was a neutral country. Flory and Heatley took a highly unusual precaution with the penicillin they carried with them. They rubbed the spores of the mold into their clothing um, so that if they were captured and the mold was taken away from them, that somehow one of them would be able to get through to the United States with the mold hidden in their, uh, in their clothing and restart these, uh, these cultures. Flory and his fellow traveler were well aware that the substance they carried was precious, but even they did not grasp its astonishing potential, a potential that was about to transform the very nature of everyday life.
Howard Florey's mission to find financial support for penicillin was successful, and in December of 1941, the production of penicillin began in America, out of reach of the bombs that were falling on Britain. The effort to produce penicillin required the full cooperation of academia and industry. It was so clear by that time that the production of penicillin needed to be as much of a priority as the production of tanks and the production of ammunition and the production of airplanes. In many ways it was like the Manhattan Project. There were literally dozens of laboratories involved in this. It was very secretive. Documentation was typically classified as confidential or secret. Among those recruited were companies focused on the manufacture of industrial chemicals, including Merck, Squibb, and Pfizer. Pfizer turned out to be in the best position because of their extensive experience producing substances like acetone, and citric acid through the process of deep tank fermentation. Imagine a glass of um, a glass half full of water. Well, there's a surface, and you can grow things on the surface there, and the mold will grow very nicely because it needs oxygen. But there's the whole volume of the liquid that is far greater than the than the surface. If you can grow the mold in that in the volume, you'd grow much much more mold, and you'd get much much more uh, product whether it's a vitamin or penicillin. Throughout 1942, penicillin remained a well-kept secret. Only a small quantity was available, and that was reserved entirely for military use. It was not until later that year when a catastrophic fire raised Boston's Coconut Grove nightclub leaving 400 victims severely burned and vulnerable to infection. But the American public became aware of this miracle drug. The drama of having this mystery drug brought in by a cavalcade of cars into Boston to treat these patients, a high-profile burn, brought penicillin to the minds of those decision makers that this is a powerful drug. And of course to the public, who then began clamoring for this miracle drug. By June of 1943, penicillin production in the United States had reached 425 million units per month, enough to treat only 170 patients. By D-Day in June of 1944, the amount produced was enough for 40,000 cases. One year later, in 1945, Alexander Fleming, Ernst Chain, and Howard Florey were awarded the Nobel Prize for medicine. The age of antibiotics had begun, and with it, the search for other miracle drugs. <laughs> 